So thank you all for coming. Um, I have thought over the past couple of years, if I just hang out with Willa, that maybe I'll be able to do all the things that she's doing. So um, thank you. So uh, to start with, you know, I see a number of people that have been in my classes, and I want to express my deep gratitude for you because this book is a result, uh, a result of the con many conversations that we've had in class uh, and, con and also uh, conversations outside of class. Uh, I'm going to really try to stay within the parameters that we have, which is a, a few minutes uh, between the two of us. Uh, you can certainly read the book. We hope that you do. Uh, we've, we've sat with this material for over two years now and had uh, thousands of hours of conversation. And so, what we're really interested in is uh, hearing uh, John Lepransky, Mama John Lepransky, and Harrison Bloom's response to our work, as well as those of you that have read the book or have questions about the book or the work that, that, we have, that we've been doing. Um, so I, I'm really, we, we want more of a dialogue, and I'm, we're willing to, we're interested in hearing you as opposed to presenting a more formal conversation about, about the book. <clears throat> so to start with, uh, let me just offer uh, <clears throat> one definition of contemplative care. Uh, this book was published by Wisdom Publication, and uh, when, when we came up with the title and the final title was sort of, you know, floated by or sort of uh, emailed, I thought, wow, that's kind of long. So those of you that know me, I tend to be really brief <laughs> and succinct about things. Uh, it's not that I don't have a lot to say, it's that usually my introverted nature takes over, and so when I heard this title, I thought, everybody will know that I didn't write this title because it's way too long, and I've teased Willa a number of times. But I do want to say that the whole question of contemplative care and the field of, of uh, contemplative care has exploded over the past, uh, I don't know, probably decade, largely driven by people like uh, Rashi Joan Halifax at Upai Zen Center, and uh, uh, and the uh, two um, Zen priests at New York Zen Center. Uh, and it's also been a question, uh, uh, obviously long before that, in prisons throughout the country, because that's really where it started. started. But let me uh, offer a definition of contemplative care so that we can at least try to be on the same page. Uh, and then I'd like to make some comments about, about uh, the process of working on the book, my reflections on working on the book, and the particular chapter that I wrote, uh, which uh, is... Uh, was used as a kind of case study. So uh, contemplative care is an approach to caregiving that incorporates meditation practice, compassionate action, and moment-to-moment -moment awareness while being with those who are suffering and dying. <clears throat> Using these practices, contemplative care seeks to transform palliative and end-of-life care, both at the individual level and system-wide level across communities Healthcare organizations. This is really important because for many years, uh, uh, Buddhist meditation, particularly, uh, people have thought of it as being very sort of circumscribed and uh, sort of a kind of an individual kind of uh, practice, and certainly it's not. Uh, by shifting the emphasis toward the well being of everyone involved in caregiving uh, to the dying, contemplative care calls on practitioners to engage in their work as a process encompassing action, reflection, and contemplation. <clears throat> Systemic change requires an understanding of interconnections, how our actions affect each other, as well as how they impact the structures of medical care. Through contemplative practice, we become more aware of how we and others interact within busy hallways, the moments of shared eye contact, and the space between our words and our intentions and thoughts. Whether we are volunteers, nurses, or bedbound patients, our very breath and steps echo with import throughout the settings which we work. Meditation and contemplation are wonderful practices that prepare and steady us to walk through the threshold of patients' rooms so that we can fully be present with them, their families, and staff. We can only be present with another if we are present with ourselves. Meditation is a key practice that prepares us to function in this compassionate way. And so as you read the book, you'll see the different chapters. The authors kind of reflect on their understanding of, of this definition of, of contemplative care. Uh, so uh, let me just also say that um, 
this is uh, actually finishing this was a pretty significant process for me. Uh, it, it meant that I was able to stay on track. And although I almost went into the convent uh, many years ago, I, I, I really um, became disciplined by working with Willer. So all the prayers and the rosaries and all those things that I said many years ago, I, I, I don't know. I probably said them every other day or something like that. What I do know is that we worked every Wednesday and every Friday for about a year and a half. And uh, if I had a headache or a sore throat or, you know, I don't want to do this today kind of feeling, well, I said, okay, I'll see you at 9 o'clock anyway. So, uh, so the book actually got done and it got done on time. And she said, we have to meet, we have to meet all the time so that even if we write out, uh, we've sent emails to people, we will be able to work. And actually, it was just a wonderful, wonderful process uh, uh, of, of learning how to collaborate and work together no matter what was going on. And so and that's what we did. No matter what was going on, we got together we worked for many, many hours. Uh, the, um, I first met Willa uh, quite a few years ago with Janet Giazzo. We took a ride to, uh, we drove to Western Mass. We were meeting up with Bernie Glassman, the Bernie Glassman, who's quite a character and uh, has uh, uh, been a clown in his life uh, and also um, done a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, his Bearing Witness program. Uh, and he's just a tremendous person. And uh, I didn't know Willa at all, and I think Janet wanted some company making this drive and having this conversation with Bernie about coming to teach here. And um, Willa and I, uh, I'd never seen it before, uh, and uh, kind of struck up a conversation, and, and we said, well, let's have tea later, and we did, and you know, one thing led to another. So we have taught probably about four courses together and really work well together. Uh, and the, the interesting thing uh, about this is, and this is sort of, you know, I won't get off track here, but it, the, the next book I write is going to be on boundaries. She's going to do something else. But uh, the, I have learned, I, I, I think I had good boundaries before. Uh, but what I've learned by working with her is how to manage multiple relationships. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is this is what we teach. When we teach pastoral care, pastoral counseling, we try to really model this and help students understand how to manage dual relationships and multiple caps as a minister uh, and monitoring relational boundaries because the situation is always changing. And so the responsibility for managing uh, the environment uh, or those relationships is really the caregiver. And so Willa is, uh, we wrote this book together. Uh, she's become a good friend. And she's also, I'm a member of, uh, this is a disclaimer, Natural Dharma Fellowship, and she's my spiritual teacher. So this is the only relationship I've ever had when, uh, you know, she's as a Lama. So I have deep respect for her in, in that way uh, and, and can actually do the bowing and really feel that expression of, of, of uh, uh, deep teaching and, and uh, enlightenment or whatever, uh, and, and at the same time think of her as a colleague at the same time without my mind going wacky about ha her having those different, you know, different um, uh, uh, relations, having different relationships with her. So, uh, so we uh, have um, enjoyed teaching, and one of the things that we, as we start to do some reflection about our courses is that we found ourselves really struggling with trying to find material to teach the course. Uh, this was a course, it, it, those of you that are here at Divinity School know that we have students that have uh, multiple religious affiliations. So they might be Christian and practicing Buddhism or Christian and Hinduism, any number of things, or no religion at all, humanism or atheism, so, or atheists. So it makes it really challenging to teach this course. The material that we found was very, very Christian. So we want to, you know, we also have a lot of UU students, Unitarian Universalist students. So we want to try to really get material that really, the best material for the different areas uh, and that reflected a different, a lot of different perspectives. And when it came to contemplative care, caregiving uh, and working with the dying, this was the area that, that, in, the, that uh, in terms of Buddhism, that was far and above uh, out there. And we both experienced some frustration about not finding material. We didn't want to do a course pack every year. It's a lot of work. Um, and so we decided, we said, oh, well, let's, let's, at some point, we'll write a book about this. And we just we kept, we, you know, we sort of said it and kind of laughing. Uh, and then we kept coming back to that point. And then so we decided, you know, let's, let's do this. So we did this. And um, the, the book itself is, I think we're both really proud of the book. Uh, and we're especially, uh, I'm especially pleased, let me speak for myself because she's going to have her time, uh, really pleased with the, the, the people who wrote in the book. The, the contributors were just outstanding people. 
And, and so I want to encourage you to sort of meet some of those people and the stories uh, that they have to tell about their, their pastoral work. Uh, my own particular story uh, was a case study about the death of my mother. This is a true story. This, this, I mean, it's a true story. I don't want to get into all of that except to say that if you read the story, it's about, uh, you know, a sort of working class mother who's, you know, dying of uh, type 2 diabetes and internal bleeding from that. And uh, one of the things that I write about in this story is talking about fear, fear and fearlessness. That, that uh, in this particular story, uh, or case study, we use, I sort of use, think of it as a case study, that um, <clears throat> one of the things that stands out front is that the chaplain really has a difficult time, actually he doesn't have a difficult time, he never comes into the room to visit my mother while I'm there at all. So, and, during the, and as I check with her and the nurses, he never goes into that room. And so my, I raise the question about uh, social class, okay? Because I come from a working class family in New Haven. Uh, I raise the question about racism. Is the fact that she's, you know, you know, poor black woman, you know, uh, th th did that have anything to do with it? And I raise questions about health care disparities, uh, which is huge in the African American community. It's also in other, other communities of color, but, you know, the focus on this in particular case study uh, was uh, limited to, to, uh, to African Americans. And so, uh, uh, and I raised questions about myself as a person who was, is a licensed psychologist. Oh, you know, I feel like, oh, I got this covered. You know, this is my mother. I can kind of handle this. Well, I, I, I didn't handle it at all. I was really, I mean, I, handling it would have meant to say to the chaplain, hey, excuse me, can you, could you come by and help us? Or I could have asked somebody else for help. No, I never asked anybody else for help uh, because I was so riveted in my own pain and grief about my mother dying. And, um, the, uh, the point of the story is that, you know, that our, our, the students that we work with uh, and, and the teaching that we've done, we've really tried to really open up some of these questions for students to be prepared, to be present to people, no matter who they are, what shape they're in, where they come from, what their social location or class is, that, that our students are, can do this. And, they, and that they can do that not by being armored you know, with a steel armor and going into the room, but going, being prepared to be with people who are dying or suffering from chronic illness by really uh, being comfortable with their, the, being comfortable with their discomfort uh, and um, being comfortable with knowing themselves in, in what, what they have to offer. So uh, I'm going to stop there because I could go on and um, there's lots to say about, about this particular book, uh, but um, I'll turn it over to Will and let her have a chance to say a few words. <clears throat> oh, thank you. So I want to thank Frank Clooney first for inviting us to come and, and talk about the book. So we're very grateful for that. And also John McCransky and Harrison for joining us on the panel. Thank you very much for being with us here. So um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about um, also how the book came about. But I'm going to talk about it a little bit from the kind of similar to, 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 um, to what Cheryl was saying from the point of view of just personal experience. Because I think we really come to the subjects we're drawn to through our personal experience and through our personal challenges and what we're meeting and seeing. And that was definitely true with this book. What, um, what drew us to it um, was partly being here at HDS and teaching together, which um, Cheryl talked about, and being <coughs> teaching these classes that were titled things like um, compassionate care for the dying from a Buddhist perspective. And um, we had one called con um, contemplative psychotherapy um, that was bringing together some of these works um, on Buddhists who practice psychotherapy and practice counseling and talk about how their practice is informed by meditation. So we were doing these kinds of classes. And one of the real inspirations for, for us was the papers that we were getting in these classes. So we would give some assignment, like write a paper about such and such, or just a very open-ended assignment. And we would get back these papers from the students here at the Divinity School that were exhibiting this really creative impulse to try to figure out, how can I language my faith 
or my uh, practice as a Buddhist in a way that I can communicate in this wider world of a divinity school. So, and for me that was fascinating too because my own background was really traditional seminary, um, Buddhist monastery, I mean you might say seminary, but there it was all different words. It was words like karma and dharma and um, ahimsa and moksha and you know, various uh, Buddhist frameworks that I was learning in and training in and coming out of that environment into just everyday life in America was a real transition for me to think about how, now how do I talk about my life and what I did there in words and in terms that other people can understand. So we saw people doing this in their papers, like trying to figure out how do you construct a Buddhist theology. In fact, what does even theology mean in our framework? Or how do we talk about chaplaincy? These words are old. They have a history in this country and they have a history in Europe. And here we are coming from Asian traditions or maybe even been brought up in Asian traditions trying to figure out how do I language this uh, in this new way. So we saw, we saw these students doing this in the papers and it was just very inspiring. <coughs> And at first I thought, well, maybe this is just just Harvard. And I should say also, part of this was inspired by um, Janet Gatso, who's my <coughs> academic advisor, and she's also the Buddhist chair here at Harvard. She started something called the Buddhist Ministry Forum in about 2004, and that was the very year that I came here. And she invited me to be on that, be in that class. It was like an informal class. There weren't even credits. It was just this, let's all talk about um, how we're going to make this work in a divinity school if we have sort of a Buddhist background, how are we going to use this language to talk about what, what we do or practice. So, so she was also very much a part, of, a part of the inspiration. I was talking about something I got off topic, but I wanted to mention that she was very much a part of the, um, the origins of, of my interest. Oh yeah, I was going to say yeah. So in this forum, um, that was also part of what we were discussing. How do we take words like divinity and seminary and ministry and chaplaincy and theology and salvation and redemption and how do we even begin to think about those if our training is from some kind of Asian religious structure? So how do we even think about those? How do we bridge the gap? So, so, so the book... Um, the book was partly also coming out of that um, conversation in the papers and also the conversation in the Buddhist Ministry Forum. And then later I attended a panel at the American Academy of Religions, which is also beginning to embrace this wider conversation. And um, Judith Simmerbrown invited me for some reason, or somehow I got onto that panel and gave a paper, and I realized it's not just Harvard. That was the point. I thought maybe this is just this group of neat students that are doing this cool stuff. But when I got to the AAR and on that panel, I realized, no, this is going on all over the United States, and nobody knows that everybody's trying to do this. Everybody's trying to come up with this language and trying to, to, to find ways to express um, what is contemplative care? What is chaplaincy and ministry and so forth? So, so that um, the book kind of arose out of those interests, and and so then I wanted to talk just for a minute about the process of writing the book. So, so Cheryl talked about that that we met at her house on Wednesdays and Fridays, and that was amazing and wonderful. And I also had a wonderful. Um, it was inspired by Cheryl also in this work and also in my time here as a graduate student, partly because she is a caregiver. And, you know, I think when you're in an academic environment, you meet so many people that are so heady. You know, I'm not saying everybody is heady in an academic environment, but there's a lot of head. And it really, I loved it. Oh, no. Oh. I loved it that her heart was so big. And so for me, that was a very much an inspiration about writing the book, how why did I feel like this book should be written, could be written with her, because her heart was so big. So, um, and that also was very helpful for me in the process of the writing. So, so what was it like to write this book? Um, 
So we just, we sent out some emails and we just solicited some chapters for the book just to see what would happen. And, and in soliciting the chapters, we found um, that we got this wide range of people t writing about what they do in contemplative care. So that the book is divided into parts and the parts are um, the foundations of contemplative care, which is kind of theoretical, like what is this? What is Buddhist chaplaincy? And then um, the second part is on hospital chaplaincy. It's called Serving the Sick. The third part is Dharma Behind Bars, Prison Chaplaincy and Ministry. The fourth is Wielding Manjusri's Sword, which is about college chaplaincy. The fifth is called Living with Dying, about end of life care, how people give care to the dying in these contexts. And and the final um, section is on the pastoral role of the Dharma teacher. So talking about things like how do we give pastoral care if we're in, a, in that kind of a setting and how do we think about it, how do we theorize it. So, so when, the, when the chapters came in, they kind of fell into those categories. So we just, we just made it into these parts and we had this kind of fantasy that maybe we would, maybe we'd have six books and then there would be like one for each, uh, for each category. But, but somehow in the end we decided, no, <laughs> gonna, one book is gonna take us long enough. So we, we just ended up doing that. So, um, so I think I'll just turn it over to the, to the panelists at this point and let them <coughs> respond. Thank you. Uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning one extra point that um, because we have another event in here tonight, uh, the reception afterwards will be in the conference room in the front. So those of you who are already beginning to feel hungry Fear not. There will, <laughs> there will be food for the body as well as the soul, but it will be up front after this session is finished. Um, I would like to introduce to you our two discussants tonight and thank them for coming to, to be with us tonight. Uh, first of all, John McCransky, uh, professor of theology uh, of Buddhism and comparative theology at Boston College, who combines his role as an academic with his role as a Tibetan Buddhist meditation teacher. I should have mentioned um, the BC connection. Um, Cheryl and I first met at BC many years back, and I was happy to have um, brought John onto the faculty at Boston College when I was over there. So it's nice to have all the fruits of BC come to Harvard and, and pay off on this side of the river. <coughs> but John is, um, has studied and practiced Tibetan Buddhism for more than 30 years under the guidance of Tibetan lamas and teachers of scholars of the Nyingma, Kagyu, and Gelug traditions. In the year 2000, he was installed as a Lama in the lineage of his first root teacher, uh, Nyoshul Ken Rinpoche, by a Lama Surya Das. John also serves currently as a senior faculty advisor and lecturer at Choki Nimya Rinpoche's Center for Buddhist Studies in um, Bodhnath, Nepal. Uh, John is author, author of a very wonderful scholarly book, which was just praised to me by another scholar the other day, called Buddhahood Embodied, Sources of Controversy in India and Tibet. He's also the co-editor of a book that continues to be talked about, Buddhist Theology, Critical Reflections by Contemporary Buddhist Scholars, as well as being the author of many articles and essays. But John, as a scholar, out of that same well of wisdom, you might say, has also practiced meditations of compassion and wisdom from Tibetan traditions for over 30 years, and has developed new ways of bringing them to the world of service and social justice, making them accessible to people of all backgrounds and all faiths. John is presently the guiding meditation teacher of the Foundation for Active Compassion, which provides meditation workshops and retreats in Buddhist contemplative settings, and in interfaith and secular settings for social justice activists, social workers, counselors, teachers, therapists, and healthcare, and other helping professionals. And John's most recent book, which again has been very valuable in many circles, is called Awakening Through Love, Unveiling Your Deepest Goodness. Our second respondent is Harrison Bloom, a recent graduate, 2012, of Harvard Divinity School with a Master of Divinity and a focus in Buddhist ministry. Um, in the same year, 2012, Harrison was conferred the title of Community Dharma Leader in the Insight Meditation Tradition. 
Already in 2006, Harrison began his moving Dharma work, offering workshops and performances that wed improvisational movement with mindfulness practice and Buddhist teachings. While co-directing study trips abroad through northern India, Harrison had the opportunity to film and edit the documentary Cutting a Rug, Turning a Wheel, Beats and Buddhism in Northern India, which played in film festivals in the summer of 2008. More recently, again, this is a person who seems to live multiple lives at once, like <laughs> the others up here. More recently, Harrison launched the Mindfulness Allies Project based on his thesis work here at HDS, a project that educates and creates partnerships to bring mindfulness training to und underserved and less resourced populations, particularly those who are vexed by racism and classism. If that all was not enough, Harrison also works as a resident chaplain at Brigham and Women's Hospital and has worked as a chaplain at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as well. And since past January, Harrison has also served as the Buddhist spiritual advisor at Northeastern University. So I believe John will go first. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Lexi, um, yeah, could somebody bring, fill this up with hot water again? Thank you. Um, my apologies, I'm just um, recovering from bronchitis, and it's not contagious anymore. But I need hot water. So, what I've been asked to do is respond to the book, and uh, what, uh, my approach to that was just to read most of it and see what it raised. So I'll speak from that place. So it raised uh, five, possibly six issues for me. And the five, uh, the five issues that I'll focus on mainly are, <coughs> and this is in the context of Buddhist chaplaincy and Buddhist ministry, where Buddhist chaplaincy prominently works with people of all faiths or no faith in settings like hospitals and prisons and so forth. No, let me say hospitals, especially hospitals. Um, what else would come out of chaplaincy that's central? Pardon, universities, but, right, and, and also helping the dying. So working across faiths. Buddhist ministry tends to work with, w within one's own faith primarily, um, in pastoral roles and education and so forth, Dharma teaching. So the first theme is deepening one's own spirituality as a Buddhist by caring for the spirituality of religious others. The second theme is the central role doctrinally of upaya or skillful means in supporting the innovations of Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry today. The third theme is Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry as a rich matrix of learning for comparative theology. The fourth theme is Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry as a rich area of investigation for Buddhist studies. The fifth theme is the chapter authors themselves as exemplary sangha in the current process of Buddhist enculturation in the West. Is that okay? Or should I talk about something else? <laughs> okay, just joking. It helps to lighten things up. That's my, so my ministerial training, I learned that. <laughs> I was struck in reading the chapters on Buddhist chaplains who are working in hospitals and with the dying, that the learning to be a deeper Buddhist practitioner by having so thoroughly to enter into the worlds of Christians and Jews and others in service to them, not explicitly for one's own awakening as a Buddhist, and that through that, somehow, unexpectedly, one's own awakening is empowered in, un in, in ways that were surprising. Let me read you. So what I'm going to be doing is reading short sections. This is from the chapter of Mark Pow Power, who's a hospital chaplain, Buddhist. He notes, within the pastoral relationship, there's a potential for an exchange that allows for spiritual healing, working in the hospital. In the current culture, defined mostly by Judeo-Christian beliefs and practices, prayer is the substance of that exchange. One could say that prayer is the currency of ministry. For that reason, it was necessary for me, a Buddhist, to learn the language and etiquette of theistic prayer. And not surprisingly, this added another layer of challenge to my training. My non-theistic beliefs were threatened, and I felt deep resistance to calling on the Lord in prayer. And I struggled, I struggled with this daily. What I noticed was that when I relaxed, 
Please listen to this sentence closely. What I noticed was that when I relaxed, there were times when theistic prayer was effortless and inspired even. And at other times when I was fearful or uptight, my experience felt empty and hypocritical. I would swing back and forth from an effortless connection to painful resistance. This dynamic was so persistent that I felt the need for some kind of clarification from my Buddhist teachers. In truth, what I wanted from them was not clarification, but permission to stop this practice of prayer <laughs> on Buddhist religious grounds. I wanted my teachers to confirm my feelings of discomfort, direct me away from this theistic pitfall, and to permit me to discontinue such prayer. When I talked with my masters, with the masters of my Tibetan Buddhist tradition about this issue, I hoped for a pass. No, you shouldn't pray with Christians. After all, you're Buddhist and we don't share their belief in God. However, that was not the response I received. I was surprised by the consistency of the message that I received from each of the masters I consulted, more than one. They said, we pray, and they, the Christians pray. There's not that much difference. I said, what? <laughs> I said, when you pray to God, imagine Amitabha, the Buddha bound this light. I wasn't given any support at all for my resistance. What Mark's describing, I think, is really profound. He was being forced to a deeper part of Buddhist experience, a part that transcends being Buddhist. To be so completely with and for others in their beliefs, which he describes in other places. Their beliefs, their ways of feeling, their ways of thinking, completely with them and for them, as you must be as a hospital chaplain, is to be pushed out of any place to hunker down in one's own beliefs and frameworks, out of necessity. It's to be pushed to become a deeper Buddhist by giving up being one for that moment by instead becoming the most simple, fully present human being that you can be. So that's where all this traditional Buddhist study and training leads. This is the bridging of the gap between Buddhist and other frameworks that Mama Willow was discussing. By deep listening, by being as fully with and for others as possible deep listening to the religious other so that they're no longer other for a moment. They're us. Reading persons as text with all the training and chaplaincy also in Christian and Jewish scriptures and so forth as background. And this shed new light for me on the meaning of Dharma as skillful means Buddhist teaching of skillful means, You're probably all familiar with the very well-known metaphor of the Dharma as a raft. When you cross the river, you leave the raft behind, the Buddha taught, you know, carry, the, carry the forms of the Dharma with you when you've arrived at what they can affect in you. Dharma, dharma here, what Mark Power was describing, I think, is something akin to an, a, approaching an ultimate expression of Dharma, a leaving of the raft behind for the moment. All teachings as upaya, skillful means, means, not ends, means to become uh, fully human and connect to others in their fullest humanity. And that brings me to my second topic, which is upaya, or skillful means. As a central implicit doctrinal concept running through the whole book, it is the, the doctrine, I think, especially central, the doctrine within which all other Mahayana doctrines intersect that this doctrine uh, is what inspires and informs these new kinds of unfolding connection across cultures and religions. Upaya, or skillful means in Buddhist doctrine, refers to a process, in, in, and it refers to many things, but one of the things it refers to is a process in which fresh and often unexpected means arise to communicate what is most spiritually beneficial in new times and places. It's just one aspect and one way of describing it. It's a key principle, as I said, of Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry. It was raised by Wako Shan and Hickey at the very end of her chapter, but she didn't trace out in that chapter in detail why it was so central. But I found, as I read the rest of the book, that the rest of the book traced it out for me. 
How does skillful means unfold in the context of Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry today? There are many poignant passages. Here's another one. This is by um, Robert Jodo Campbell, who's one of the um, pioneers of the chaplaincy program in New York that Cheryl referred to, talking about his chaplaincy training in New York years ago. He said, my mind wanders to a day during my chaplaincy training in New York. I was assigned to the pediatric unit of a large hospital on the Upper East Side, and it was there that I met Emma, four years old, and a joy to behold. Her mother, a very well-groomed woman in her late 30s, was playing with the little girl lying in the bed. Emma was unaware of her brain and spinal cancer. She was giggling and kicking her feet in the air. This child was cherished and had the best modern medicine could offer. But even so, she would not survive. Her father, a surgeon at another hospital in New York, looking bewildered and exhausted, asked me, where is God right now, chaplain, huh? Why is this happening to my little girl? It makes no sense. You're the chaplain. You tell me, where is God? At that moment, Emma giggles and with outstretched arms calls, Daddy. And suddenly I looked to the tiny bed and then to him and said gently, there is God. The family was deeply Catholic, so I offered this prayer for Emma. Father of tenderness and compassion, you sent your son to share our human nature, to redeem all people and to heal the sick. Look with love on your children who are sick. Support them with your power. Give them hope in times of suffering. Keep them always in your care. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. How does skillful means unfold in the context of Buddhist chaplaincy and ministry? Robert Camo, who I just read, is a Zen priest, Zen Buddhist. The learning that comes from being so intimately with and for another person, sharing their world, deepens one aware, one's awareness of Buddhist principles such as non-duality and compassion while bringing out their further meaning. And this experience can then add to the knowledge of one's Buddhist community and institutions which is part of the purpose of sharing this book, I think, part of the reason why Cheryl and Willa put it together, empowering the Buddhist communities and institutions who read such chapters with new ways to meet the world's needs, which is also upaya. One more short passage. This is by uh, uh, a prisoner named Mike, who was trained by a Buddhist prison chaplain, Neely Zimmerman. Mike is assisting in, in the dying process of a fellow inmate, Jay. And he describes the process of being with Jay during his dying hours. Then he concludes by saying, as all this was unfolding, his experience with Jay, the common qualities abounded, compassion, concern, love, all the reasons people volunteer to do this hospice work. But again, from a prisoner's perspective, the writer is a prisoner, it just seems there's a more intense awareness of every little nuance of Jay's care. Every person, every one person paid such attention to everything as we changed him, as we watched him, as staff came and went. This was our death. We prisoners, we were given the gift to be here with Jay. This was each and every one of us, as seen through our own vision in the patient's eyes. I think every, every man present to some degree saw himself in that bed, being thankful to take care of the smallest detail, making Jay as comfortable as possible in these parameters. That's the gesture toward the compassion of non-duality I was referring to earlier. This is not high Buddhist philosophy. This is lived Buddhist philosophy. 
each of us saw ourselves on that bed. Dean Slater, another prison chaplain on page 114. Oh, I think it'll be too much time. We'll go on. It's a powerful one. Read it later if somebody wants. Such writings, which are expressing this intuitive working out of upaya or skillful means through the uh, exigence, the imperative, to be this fully with and for another in their world, not, not your own world which chaplaincy and ministry demands is an opportunity for the deepest kind of Buddhist practice, as I said. But it's also writings like this provide a rich matrix for Buddhist, a direction toward a Buddhist comparative theology. By so, so deeply engaging beliefs and practices of religious others, also Buddhist others, and you're a Tibetan Buddhist and a Cambodian Buddhist, is your patient or, or your... Uh, client, and so on. By so deeply engaging the beliefs and practices of religious others, a point is reached where the other can no longer be experienced as other, even while still being so, revealing further possibilities of Buddhist understanding and practice, like Robert Chodo Campbell's prayer to our Lord in Christ. Another example is by Ginger Brooks. who's a hospice chaplain, and she describes, of my deceased patients, the one I miss most is, this, is a devout and brilliant Episcopalian, a former private school headmaster with whom I shared weekly communion for eight months. Again, she's a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist chaplain. His dementia was fairly advanced, and he lived in a typical nursing home, which was not a pleasant place. Although communion, Eucharistic communion, is served weekly in the Episcopal Church, this patient had never experienced it one-on-one. -on -one. Together, we marveled at its depth. Each time, sometimes in the middle of the liturgy, he would exclaim that he was hearing and feeling parts of it for the first time, and he would tell me in what ways it was new for him. And each week when I read it to him, it was as though I too was feeling and hearing it for the first time, and I would tell him how it was new for me, the non-dualism for me of Christ's words from the service, abide in me as I in you, doesn't get much clearer. And with those lines, the sacred began to be present for him, and I followed him there. This kind of deep engagement in the religious world of others cannot help but open just almost break open doorways of new perspective and insight and inquiry into the very heart of one's own faith. And that's where it becomes a rich matrix of material also for people interested in comparative theology to reflect deeply upon. Again, uh, text in a wider sense. The chapters that summarize current innovations in working out the needed studies and trainings for Buddhist chaplains and ministers are also a rich area of reflection for Buddhist studies, I would argue, as a living study of Buddhist enculturation. How Buddhist concepts and practices are sifted through and winnowed and reordered, new implications of them discovered, as Buddhists work to meet the mentalities and needs and pedagogical approaches and social and economic structures of a new culture, and how all that changes the culture, how Buddhism is penetrating this culture vastly now way beyond also the institutions of chaplaincy and ministry, and how Buddhism is being profoundly affected and changed by that. The chapters by Judith Kinst and Wako Shannon Hickey, Lou Richmond, and Grace Shireson describe this winnowing and the curriculum, the developing of new curriculum in the context of all these new issues. It's like watching, again, very, very different, but also very analogous watching what happened in China and Tibet and East Asia and South Asia and Southeast Asia as Buddhism spread and was totally changed by its response to totally different conditions <laughs> and how it changed the culture in ways that would be foundationally affecting such that we receive Buddhism today from those cultures. 
Rebecca Johnson, who's a black uh, Buddhist minister, explains how she taps the power of the Brahma Viharas of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, especially with people of color, to expose and make vivid the fundamental goodness of our being, our deep identity, beyond anyone's power to demean or deny, from which we learn to uphold the potential of all involved in a racially charged society while working for social change. Lama Willow described d discovering the meaning of being a Buddhist minister in the West by revisiting what it means in Tibet based on a uh, famous Tibetan commentary on what it means to be a good listener to the Dharma. Except Willow reverses it, reverses the role of teacher and student. We learn to listen to the Dharma in the hearts of those we are teaching, counseling. We learn to reverse the role. We learn to listen to the teacher in them deeply, vividly the depth of wisdom in the student as teacher. And that's the fundamental role of the Buddhist teacher in the West. She does it beautifully with Patra Rinpoche's commentary. My final point is that the writers of the chapters, as I was reading them, as you can probably tell, is experiencing them as exemplary sangha for the current process of Buddhist enculturation. They were showing me and teaching me things as fellow members of the Buddhist sangha. Here we are. It's a challenge, isn't it, fellas and gals? It's not so easy here in the West. Maybe in the past we lived in other cultures. Who knows? Buddhists believe that. At least some do. But now we're here. It's not so easy here. It's also a remarkable place to be. It's a reason. must be a reason we're here. And we have so much to learn from each other. Companions on the path. The writers of these chapters demonstrating the courage to go beyond formulas and easy pre-made Buddhist answers into the wilderness of genuine new learning, and to share it as in this book, so we can all benefit. Thank you. I remember why I took uh, two courses with Professor McCransky when you were here at HDS. I like hearing myself talk, but I would have liked to have heard you talk for longer, too. <laughs> I want to start with just a, a brief line from the editor's preface. Um, Cheryl and Willa wrote, this book is also for them, talking about the, um, the other Buddhist ministers and chaplains and people tapping, uh, tapping into this field. And I, I felt that as I read it. I felt, um, I felt comforted that I was not alone. I have most often been the only Buddhist in my chaplaincy and uh, ministerial settings. Uh, I felt inspired and validated. It was, uh, and I would say healed in some ways, uh, amidst some of the loneliness that can come up. Um, even with the welcoming, the peers I have in this field, um, some loneliness. Oh, why is it always about God? Or where's the Buddhist language? Or um, So thank you for welcoming me. So I'm grateful for a lot of people here. I can't spend my whole time speaking about gratitude. I am grateful for my mom. She's in the audience, so she, she deserves the big shout out. Um, also, towards the beginning of the bo uh, uh, book, Pat Enkyo O'Hara mentions um, there's something, she says there's just something about the Buddhist chaplains. Simply the way they walk down the hall seems to put people at ease. I hope Pat's a woman, by the way. I don't know all these people very well, so it occurs to me if Pat's a man, I'm um, misquoting or misrepresenting. But so, okay, these Buddhist chaplains, they walk down the hallway with ease, and that makes me think of bumping into a neighbor's friend a few months ago. We had just a brief interaction on a front porch in the morning. I didn't think much of it, and I later heard that when this friend learned that I'm Buddhist, the response was, oh, that explains it. <laughs> um, so I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I hope that um, professional Buddhists supported by a practice of meditation, as you spoke, up, spoke of, can have something, and maybe even something unique, to offer uh, these engaged fields. So my comments will be in three sections. Um, the first is mainly about presence, the pastoral uh, relationship. The second one is about race and class. And the third one is about um, the Buddhist part of this. What's the Buddhist part? Not just chaplaincy, but 
Buddhist chaplaincy, perhaps, or being a Buddhist while being a chaplain or a minister. Uh, a few lines about presence drawn from the book. Uh, Jennifer Block speaks of steady companions, the role of being a steady companion. Um, Kirsten DeLeo, when asking a dying man, what can I do for you? The response, just be my friend. Daijaku Judith Kinst speaks of a first step as being less anxious than the people we're serving. I've, I've loved this line for a few years now. Being with the impossible when there is no solution. Uh, Joan Halifax. There's many others. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl herself writes, when we sincerely try to help others by giving compassionate care, our success does not rest on whether or not we believe we can help. Success comes from the act of caring. Uh, and it goes on. I probably could have quoted several lines from each chapter about this quality, this foundational quality of presence. Um, and as I started to think about that word presence, also the word transmission came up for me. And we, we each might have different associations, but I, I have come to understand and, and use the word transmission for an offering of presence. As the Buddha taught, one person's mindfulness can be an invitation into mindfulness for those around them. So I feel there's some act of transmission of offering a example of consciousness that perhaps those around us can uh, step into a bit. So there's gotta be more to it than that though. Okay, be present, great. So what, what do we do with that? Or what does that look like? Um, one model of what that can look like that was mentioned throughout the book um, is the Zen maker, uh, Zen peacemaker three tenets, which I've also appreciated for some time, not being Zen myself, but um, these tenets, three of them, not knowing, bearing witness, and compassionate action. And these are outlined and spoken of in more detail in the chapters um, by Robert Chodo Campbell and also Steve Kanji Rule. Uh, and Chris Berlin does speak of not knowing a bit also. So I was inspired and I, thought I had the thought to share three brief vignettes uh, from my own experience. I'll, I'll mix some quotes and some of my own experience as a hospital chaplain, as a university chaplain. The not knowing um, felt palpable for me when I showed up for my first infant fetal demise. Uh, I was quite surprised at the smallness of this human body, also how red it was, just held in the palm of the father's hand. Um, I had some calm, some trust in not knowing, I really don't know what to do here, um, and some calm also. And so I put, uh, I put the experience to prayer as was their wish to have a baby blessing. And I don't remember exactly what I said. I remember feeling a bit clumsy while doing it, like, I'm used to praying in a whole lot of other situations, but what do I wish for someone who didn't have a life? Um, and yet I do trust that some amount of, uh, tr of presence amidst not knowing was a comfort to them. A few weeks later, my second uh, instance of offering a blessing for a baby, infant fetal demise, um, I felt I was a bit more present, able to bear witness the second tenet that's, uh, that is described in several chapters of the book. Um, was able to be present just enough to see the mother's love for this small child and then put some of that into language again as they requested a prayer. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I think it included something like, loving God, I ask that you take this young child and hold him lovingly as his mother now does in her lap. So as we bear witness, we can um, offer connections. We can speak to what we are witnessing. And compassionate action. Um, I think of an example, a family meeting, nothing more could be done medically for, I, I believe, a late 70-year-old individual whose spouse was in the family meeting with many doctors. And the, the medical team handled it beautifully, and also they, they didn't speak to specifics of the logistics of withdrawing life support. And so I took it upon myself to say, you know, I don't know if this is premature, but perhaps we could talk about actually what that means. Um, offering examples. Some families choose to be there right before it's withdrawn and go in the room after or not be there or circle around the bed and share stories or share prayer. Um, so the medical team and the family thanked me for bringing it up as especially because the family lived over two hours away. It was a hardship to commute to the hospital. Um, so not just being comfortable and not knowing and bearing witness but taking uh, action, raising our voices. So some of the voices in the book, many of them actually, I have about 10 examples, I'll only read a few. Um, many of them spoke to what I think John was referring to as sharing their world, sharing the world of those that we are uh, ministering to or visit, visiting with. 
Um, Ginger Brooks in her chapter writes, we, we do not need to interpret reality for the people that we are working with. They have their own intelligence. We can trust them to see and to learn. We can accompany them in that process. Chris Berlin, it was important for me to, re to release any impulse I had to fill in what initially felt like a lack in, in her spiritual life. Becoming selfless in this moment meant relinquishing my ideas, attachments, and perceptions about what I believed would have benefited Jane most. Um, and as I learn about um, you know, how to be a chaplain in the hospital, Carl Rogers' client-centered therapy comes to mind, a book written in 1951, um, based on respecting others' capacity and right to self-direction, a deep respect for the significance and worth of each person, and significantly, adopting the client's frame of reference. And I think that's a, a deep skill that perhaps we might say is, um, is inherent or comes naturally to at least the people uh, sharing their voices in these chapters. I guess I, I would also lift that up as a delicate balance, something to discern uh, what are the differences between a, let's say, a hospital chaplain and a Dharma teacher uh, and an academic. I feel that um, in the small experience I've had offering the, <laughs> offering the Dharma, uh, there is, I feel, more room for an, an instructive role, a guiding role. Um, certainly in academia, um, what's your conclusion? What do you make out of this? Where's your voice? What do you say? Um, and so it has been a learning curve to uh, make it more about them than about me. Not, um, not what do I think about them, but what do they think about them? And that's lifted up in, um, again, like I said, about at least a dozen examples in this book. I was going to start a timer when I started speaking, but I forgot to. I want to lift up a few ideas about race and class that are um, mentioned in the book. Uh, Cheryl writes, one of the critical challenges to American Buddhism is to encourage Dharma teachers to focus on anti-racism work in their sanghas. I want to pair that line uh, with a line from the editor's preface. It became clear that we are in the middle of a revolution. These revolutionaries are reimagining practice along interpersonal lines and taking Buddhist practice into places where it has simply never been, at least in the West. And so as I do believe we're in the beginning of something of a revolution or a new wave, um, I would call on it to be crucial that um, the training for Buddhist chaplains, for Buddhist ministers, have a, a foundational anti-racism and anti-oppression component, that it not be an add-on. Um, I have seen and experienced the differences of a Dharma center that starts where a people of color group and a LGBTQ group are some of the first groups to meet weekly. And I've experienced a Dharma center where after a few decades, people of color groups and LGBTQ groups are added. And it's a big difference. I've seen success in trying to add it. And I've also seen how it's slow and it's clumsy and it takes work. Not that it never uh, takes work, but if we can put what's needed at the foundation, I think that's cru uh, crucial. I was tempted to go off with all sorts of quotes and um, statistics about race and class. I think I'll uh, direct you to my thesis afterwards, not to get too sidetracked. <laughs> I have like a, okay. So I, I'll, I'll end with a section with some talking about uh, the Buddhist part of this. Um, and I have a few responses to what I was reading in the book about that. So three different author, authors, at least, I found there was um, some practice of not, um, not identifying as Buddhist. I'll, I'll put it in their words. Um, Mark Power speaks of sometimes allowing a misconception that we're Christian uh, or answering that he's non-denominational. And uh, so he, he writes, this allowed me to continue in my relationship with the patient. Over time, I found this approach more satisfying and pastorally effective. Richard Torres writes about prison chaplaincy. I have a hard time answering that question and usually sidestep it by telling them that I serve people of all faiths or no faith at all. And Ginger Brooks, I am not a Buddhist chaplain, I am a hospice chaplain. If I identify myself as a Buddhist chaplain, an interfaith chaplain, or a Protestant chaplain, I risk inviting preconceptions on the part of my patients. 
So I have to, I, I have to, and I do trust their experience. And I also challenge, uh, challenge that if it becomes too much of a baseline or of a norm, I suggest there are preconceptions with whatever we say or whatever we don't say, and that I think there's room and it's important to say. Uh, either when asked or when it feels appropriate, I am, I'm Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist chaplain and I serve people of all faiths and no faith. Um, in my experience, when I've offered that, which might be 20% of the time, it's, it's not the majority, but it happens. Um, the vast majority of the times when I do share that I'm Buddhist, I feel the relationship gets closer, that, uh, that people are interested and feel like I'm trusting them with something, that this huge part of the pastoral relationship is being real, and they feel like I'm being real with them. I have more authority to stand in being honest about who I am, especially maybe if it's different than they are. I think this, uh, what I'm sharing as my experience is perhaps aligned with what Tenzin Chodron writes. To my surprise, she did not ask for the nun and the priest after that initial visit. Rather, she wanted to continue our connection. So, oh, you, you don't want a nun, you don't need a priest, I'm, you want to continue with me, okay. So whether we say we're Buddhist or not, there's still the issue of what to do with God. How do we talk about God? How do we pray to God? Of course, especially if that's not our practice or our language or our belief. I've been um, helped by Rabbi David Cooper's book, God as a Verb, to start to open up to the idea of God as a wave more than a, <coughs> more than a particle, uh, open possibility perhaps, not necessarily a, a definite being who chose to create this world. And as I kind of started with mentioning presence, trusting the unknown, I, um, I find that that sincerity, my, my own Buddhist practice, helps me to show up um, with a sincere, loving heart so that I can bear witness, um, open-minded, invoking a loving God as I stand there loving whoever this person is and whatever their circumstance is. Two more, um, or maybe three more ideas Briefly, APC certification, the nuts and bolts of the field, is mentioned by Mark Power. Um, the importance of being able to be certified, not just trained. Steve Kanji Rule mentions the empowering practicality of the reverend title and pastoral work. That's an important uh, aspect he's pointing to. How are we trained and how are we credentialed? What's expected in the hospital world or the university world? A few words on mindfulness, I think, will suffice. And then I do have two questions to pose for us or for the editors. Uh, Ji, Hyang, Ji Hyang Padma writes about college uh, chaplaincy. Within a rigorous college environment, meditation practice offers students a way of coming home to the body and extending to themselves unconditional presence and kindness. I found this to be true working at Northeastern, guiding uh, mindfulness sessions once a week, not religiously uh, connected to Buddhism as I offer it. And I, uh, I suspect and um, name that I, th I think there will be a growing role for Buddhist chaplains, trained Buddhists, to offer <coughs> non-religious mindfulness trainings as mindfulness becomes uh, or gets further traction in, in wider society. So um, I think it's a both and. How can we be Buddhist and how can we offer um, how can we offer to those who are not Buddhist and might not want the religious aspect? I think that as Buddhist as we want to be and are, we should expect that we might first be asked, okay, we need someone to offer mindfulness or de-stressing. Um, how do we adapt to those requests? So Willa writes, it is time for Buddhist communities in the West to more actively acknowledge and prepare students in training for the particular skills needed in reality for Buddhist teachers. Uh, St Steve Kanji Rule speaks of in 2005, his peers here at HDS uh, were baffled and kind of shocked when he said, well, I think I want to be a Zen Buddhist minister. Really? How, how do you do that? Um, we're doing that. Happily, HDS is doing that. And um, I guess a question or challenge, I really don't know, but I wonder, 
more than offering can we require? Could there be a certificate in uh, Buddhist pastoral care or chaplaincy? And what would that look like? What does it mean not just to offer courses and training, but to um, say, yeah, this person graduated with a focus on Buddhist ministry, and that means, in, in my case, uh, field education that included pastoral care, a counseling course, anti-racism work, uh, Buddhist ministry courses, interfaith work. What would it look like to name specifically, this is what you need to do, not just what's available? And a second and closing question, um, what can we do not only to train chaplains, but to advocate for the profession more broadly? At the same time that there's research coming out that shows chaplaincy care is cost effective for hospitals, uh, lowers the time in the hospital at end of life care and lowers hospital costs, chaplaincy departments are also sometimes thought of as an add-on. At Dana-Farber, for exam example, um, in 2011, the new state-of-the-art Yaki building was built, and my understanding is it went over budget, and as a result, the entire chaplaincy department was cut, save for the director. Um, so there's a need for qualified chaplains and there's a need for advocacy for that, uh, for that job to exist. And what can we do to advocate for that? I'll leave it at that, thanks. Before, we'd like to go for about uh, 15 minutes of formal discussion, conversation. Um, we're going to move yeah. the chair, and then people, they can sit facing. And then um, we'll move to the informal reception up front, where people can carry on. So we need skillful means here to move this couch. So, um, I think just briefly, if either Cheryl or Willa would like to say anything about the responses, but certainly we want to leave time for questions. <coughs> so, if you would like to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheryl, Willa. So, I don't have anything to say yet. Okay. I really want to say. Okay. Willa, would you like to? No, I think we can open it for okay. questions and comments. So why don't you feel the questions? You can somehow figure out yourself how to deal with the questions. Why don't you talk for Zell? I'm a Navy chaplain. Um, I'm senior enough that I supervise other chaplains. I've had the privilege uh, as a Lutheran pastor to uh, supervise a Orthodox rabbi. I have not supervised a Buddhist. Uh, fascinating uh, presentations by everyone. Uh, but I was challenged, uh, especially during the readings uh, that were given. Um, I think I heard that a, a Buddhist practitioner was celebrating communion with a priest who had not, that the, that the presider over that communion service was the Buddhist chaplain. Yes. Uh, that stretched me uh, beyond my comfort zone. Uh, and then when the, uh, when, uh, the Buddhist uh, chaplain prayed, invoking the name of Jesus the Christ. Um, pastorally, uh, that part of me loved it. Um, I began to think about uh, the practice of being a chaplain in the military, provide for your own, facilitate for others. Um, if I were to share uh, communion, especially with a Roman Catholic. Uh, I would have priests uh, very, very upset, um, feeling that I had not been a very good chaplain because I had shared communion one-on-one -on -one with a Roman Catholic, and that's verboten. Um, and if I were uh, to be in pastoral care with a Buddhist, which I have not. Um, I feel badly that I'm totally unequipped to use a language and to pray in a language that um, might be helpful to someone who was a faithful practicing Buddhist. So I'm struggling through all of this. Uh, I've raised a number of issues, but 
that's what struck me as I listen. Thank you. Sure. Um, so within each situation being uh, specific and different needs, um, that is in my phrase, when asked, I tell them I'm Buddhist, and when I feel it's important, uh, uh, particularly if they have a very strong faith connection and I f it's clear that they're projecting another, you know, not that I am what I'm not, basically. I think transparency is important. Um, and I also feel it's important for patients to, I'll speak in the hospital setting, for patients to get what they get before they, um, uh, I had a clever way of phrasing this, anyway, to get what they get before they're uh, told what they're getting. In other words, for them to have a bit of chatting with me, to have a relationship form before I, in the first minute or two, say I'm a Buddhist chaplain, um, for them to experience it before it's named, I guess. Uh, we. At the Brigham, at least, we have specific Eucharistic ministers who give communion, and I don't give communion. There, there are protocols for who gives communion and who doesn't, um, perhaps for similar reasons as what you're raising concerns. And I, I guess lastly, I'll just say that I do end a fair amount of prayers with, I pray in Jesus' name. I do that with Catholics, and... Um, I didn't start doing that, but I've grown more comfortable doing that. And for me, it comes back to the sincerity. Like, as when I baptize a child for the first time, I was taught by a priest, if your intentions are sincere, you can baptize. I'm not saying baptizing is the same as communion. I actually wouldn't know. I'd have to learn more about those subtleties. But, but when I end a general prayer in Jesus' name, I, I do have, I've cultivated some love for Jesus in my heart, respecting him as a divine figure, <coughs> or at least a realized figure, I could say. Um, and I stand in respect to that. The one one John that talks about God being love is also kind of along those lines, a, a bridge, an enabler for me to sincerely pray to God, who I don't know if this person does, but I, I do sincerely call him on. So I'll, I'll jump in and respond. I think the one of the things that, that Harvard Divinity School has done well is um, be a place where there's lots of diversity, religious diversity, and there's this thing called learning ministry. And so there is, is not a Buddhist track, so people don't, it's not a seminary. People don't come here to be sort of indoctrinated or sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of <coughs> settling into their own religious tradition and, uh, and not being exposed to uh, other perspectives. So everybody, whether you're a Christian or, or non-theistic, atheist or humanist or, or Buddhist, <coughs> has to study Old Testament, has to study New Testament, has to do an advance. So, so you get the point. So and that, this, is, this is the whole idea of a learning ministry, that you really have some understanding of, of uh, religious <coughs> traditions and spirituality across uh, a broad spectrum. And um, this is this is the result of that. So that when we have people, when you get to a hospital as a chaplain, we're doing hospice work. I mean, you're really doing interfaith chaplains, interfaith hospice. There's no such thing as sort of a, a, a Buddhist chaplain, or uh, at least from our perspective, uh, uh, that even if you're a Christian, if you're Lutheran, if you're going into a hospital, you're interfaith Catholic. Because you, I might be lying in the bed uh, and be Buddhist, and you know, and you and you you said, can I, you might say, can I visit you today? Well. I mean, and that's where you have to have some fluidity in being able to really... So that's one piece of it. The other piece is the presence piece. Um, a lot of what, what I started to talk about early about uh, leaning into your discomfort, we work with our students a lot about sitting with their discomfort. It doesn't feel so great. Uh, we also sit and practice out of our discomfort. Um, and, and that for, so for me, concretely, that means I'm not extroverted. So I'm working hard sitting up here in this chair. You can't see it, but you, if you know how hard I was working sitting there, I would much rather be sitting back there than be sitting here. But the point is that, you know, that, that, um, that uh, our students take this very seriously, this bearing witness, this, this working with their discomfort. Uh, and the discomfort might be, gee, I don't really believe in this theistic stuff, or I don't really want to do that. But in terms of presence and presencing, that we are, or the work that we've committed ourselves to do is to be there for others, be there for that person. So if I'm a Buddhist chaplain and I come to visit you and you're a Lutheran, you know, uh, and, I, and I say, let's meditate for a moment, that might not work for you. My influence might work for you, focusing on the breath, that kind of thing. But the Tibetan stuff that I do that I'm into, you know, that doesn't mean anything to you. 
you. It might, it, if, you know. So one of the things that we work, we, we try to do with our students is to really be present and to ask people what they need and respond to, to the need, to that particular need, as opposed to coming in with an agenda um, and trying to kind of work from a place of, you know, um, of, of having an agenda ahead of time. You know, just being there, uh, the not knowing, trying to open up, see what unfolds in, in that relationship. It's a relationship. It's not about, you know, um, uh, having a set agenda that we kind of drop on people. So, I don't know, what, what do you want to add anything? Well, I was, I was just going to mention that in some of the chapters this comes up, and, and one of the things that we noticed, or I noticed with some of the chapters, is that when a Buddhist chaplain or someone who self-identifies that way is called to do something like a christening or some sort of thing around a, a transition, they always look for somebody who is, who is of that faith, of the person who's going through that transition, birth or death or whatever. But the truth is, in reality, in a hospital and sometimes in a prison, those th there may not be seven chaplains of every different faith. There just isn't sometimes. So, so then, in those cases, the question then becomes, what is the compassionate response? What is the compassionate response in this situation? And what does the family want, given that they know who you are as a chaplain? What do they want you to do? And it's interesting that some of the responses surprised us in the book. Sometimes the family wants the Buddhist minister to say something about whatever, you know, say a prayer with me about Jesus. They don't mind. So I think it's very individual. We notice that in the book. That sometimes it's very individual what happens when someone walks into, into a hospital room. Let me say something else about CPE, clinical pastoral education. So part of it is you spending three years studying here at, at Divinity. At this, that, this is sort of the way we do it. Uh, but the other piece is, and in, in Harrison currently is a, uh, is a resident, and that means he's had what, three units? Yeah, fifth unit. So, and this is all supervised, intensive supervised work. Are you familiar with CPE? Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so, you know, the, the CPE is, you know, he's approaching a, a board certification as a chaplain. Uh, and, um, I mean, that's the only game in town in terms of certifying people. But it's been around for uh, quite a few years, like 50, 60 years, something like that. Uh, and that, they have, it's highly respected. And, and, and at that level where you are, I mean, there's an expectation that you uh, really are um, skillful in interfaith, uh, um, interfaith, interfaith work with, uh, with patients. So, so I think we answered some of your questions. I don't think, I think some of them are, you know, might have gotten lost in the... Other questions? Other questions? Yeah, I... Uh, just to briefly uh, continue the issue of interfaith hospital chaplaincy coming from a minority religious perspective, um, one of the things that has happened to me certainly um, that I want to get your reactions to, from particularly from a Buddhist perspective, is that patients will uh, will come up to me and say, "Oh, um, you know, I like what you're doing. Let me find out more about Judaism. Maybe I want to be Jewish, or maybe I'd like to switch my religious affiliation." Um, and so what's the, you know, in the practice of hospital, I, I mean, I can only imagine prison chaplaincy might be similar because people are kind of on a religious journey and they have time. Um, <laughs> when you're in a long-term hospital stay, i got to tell you, you know, these folks are kind of on a journey. You know, they're, they're thinking about religion. They're thinking about God or, or whatever it is that, that, that is meaningful to them. Um, so how do you balance your, what I thought was a beautifully articulated value in being present for the person really across the boundaries of faith and being of service to somebody who's of a different faith um, and kind of balancing that with somebody who comes in and says, okay, you know, now I think I want to maybe be a Buddhist instead. Has, has that happened or what do you do in that situation? <coughs> I think you keep turning it back to them. You know, what does that what does that mean for you? Why? What's that like for you? Why do? You, where does your interest lie? What do you hope to get out of? Just keep hearing them, and then if it gets to the point, I think your concern might more be the actual. I want to be Buddhist. I want to convert. I, where, what's the address of the center? That more taking action. Um, I think I give the information, 
And I also, I'll share this is related, I think, I taught a secular five-week mindfulness series at a local low-income uh, community center. And at the end of it, anticipating people might want more, I made available some uh, information for a local insight meditation center, also a local centering prayer group in a Christian tradition, and a secular mindfulness-based stress reduction program uh, that's not, that wasn't clinical related, so they could do it without a specific medical concern. So, yeah, they're <coughs> putting different resources in their hands when appropriate. I think it's important to inquire into what they really want. And that inquiry never ends. Mm -hmm. And that's the inquiry I would launch. I don't mean saying it that way. <laughs> but uh, anybody who presents, like, I think it should be this way or that way, I just want to know what they want. And that'll take a long time to sort through. And that organically something will come out of that. It's unlikely it'll be what they first fantasized. Hi, Nori. Yeah. I'm Nori Friedlander. I'm a PhD student in the study of religion. I also serve as a Muslim chaplain here at Harvard. Um, so I wanted to call attention to one of the kind of gifts that I think the work you're, you're doing is bringing. And that's, I, I see there's been a lot of talk about how wonderful this is for Buddhist chaplains to have a resource, to be able to teach from this, to be able to learn from this. It's also a gift to us who are coming from um, minority religions, traditions, or religious traditions that don't have a concept of chaplaincy, and we're finding ourselves in contexts where there's a need for the work that chaplains do, and a lot of us are kind of making it up as we go along um, in the absence of the kinds of resources that you're looking to provide for Buddhist chaplains. So I, I also see this as modeling for other faith communities, and in looking like what is Islamic chaplaincy look like? What are the issues we need to, to tackle? Um, what are the questions we need to be asking? I also think the work that you're doing provides a great kind of roadmap um, to do that. So thank you. Um, I look forward to reading it. We have time for one more question. Uh, I was taken by a couple of things that uh, in the responses, uh, since I tend to, I, I'm the uh, associate dean for ministry here, so I tend to think about program requirements, <laughs> <laughs> functions, and um, so the notion that John brought up about the ways in which uh, Buddhism is penetrating the society and that's having bi-directional changes in the landscape, and Harrison's comment about the, the notion that um, there are things that wish we required here a certificate or that sort of thing. Um, and one of the things that occurs to me is that we that we need to be in a conversation uh, in, in this sense. In, a, in the Divinity School, we make available um, a variety of things for people to meet the, the requirements of their various traditions. And so there might be a place for imagining uh, a Buddhist chaplaincy authorization of some form, organizations that would say, we want our chaplains to have these kinds of things that would then provide, it wouldn't have to be a certificate, it would provide an impetus for saying, okay, this is in the same way that the Unitarian Universalist minister is expected to have a certain set of things, we expect our Buddhist chaplains to have those. On the other side, of it, and why I think it's a conversation, is of course, there are things that, as uh, Cheryl said, it's not a, we, we have an integrated MDiv program. And so consequently, we, we need to be in a constant conversation about the changing landscape of pastoral care, religious leadership, uh, and all of that. And to, to think that what are the things that we need to be doing to, to keep our program <coughs> working in the right directions for all of that. So I guess it's both an invitation uh, to to conversation, but also an invitation to, to imagine uh, possibly some organizational um, things on the Buddhist side. That's wonderful. I, the, the one place that I know that's doing that is Upadi Zen Center with Rashi Joan Halifax. That once you go through that program, the credentialing is that you're ordained as a, a Buddhist chaplain. So um, this is without formal CPE, but you can just sort of. But also the one in New York, right? But, uh, I don't know if they're doing no. that. Not yet? Not yet. I think, I think you could probably have someone who's doing that yet. 
But I was thinking even something, you know, uh, similar to APA. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know that yeah. says, okay, it doesn't have to be associated with a particular school, yeah. but what the, what right. the Buddhists would take you know, could have the <laughs> responsibility of saying, this is what we want our people to have. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So I think we shouldn't think that the, the conversation is ending, but rather the formal part is. As I mentioned, there's another event in this room, um, and the room has to be reset up. This is a lovely reception up front. Um, our Pied Pipers in front will fairly quickly move there, and you'll follow them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank.